The Avenue, Madame and Monsieur, Screenwriters Rewatch du Département de Scénario. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Screenwriters Rewatch from the Script Department. We're continuing our journey through IMDb's top 250 film list, and in this episode, I'm joined by Peter Salisbury, and we'll be talking about the 2001 Jean-Pierre Junet film, Amelie. Join Peter and I for our full-length discussion over on our podcast, where we'll be deciding whether or not it deserves a place in the script department vaults, which are surreptitiously hidden behind the bathroom tiles. Welcome back to Screenwriters Rewatch, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> Always a pleasure. And we've got we've got another another foreign language film. We've got another subtitle film. Co- total coincidence, not it not is. planned. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, we, we've got Amelie, which, uh, as we've mentioned, is is a French film. It is spoken in French with subtitles. Uh, and I've, I have to confess, I have always wanted to watch this film because visually it always really appealed to me. But growing up, that the fact that it was a French film, it really, the language was a barrier and I didn't know if I could watch the film, enjoy the visual aspect of it and do the subtitles and keep up with the story. Um, uh, and I, what brought me back to this film last year, I started learning a bit of French and, you know, it's always good practice to watch and listen as much as you can. Um, so I only watched it for the first time last year and really enjoyed it. And it was quite a throwback to my teenage years being filmed in 2001. The depth of character that really shines through the story was what really made me endear to it. And it was just a pleasure to be able to watch it again. But for you, tell me, why Amelie? Oh, gosh, I first saw it in 2001 at the cinema. And, of course, I had no French, but I, I enjoyed it and watched the subtitles and followed follow the narrative along anyway. And I think what drew me or what... Um, well, yeah, what drew me to it was it was just a magical film. Uh, the characterization I thought was great. I love, I love films that are quirky. Uh, it's quite lighthearted. It's quirky with an element of fantasy to it. And those are the kind of movies that really uh, draw me into them. Um, I think that's why. Quirky, fantasy, great characters. Oh, and I love the way she looks at you. She just turns and looks at you. I just thought, wow, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's very piercing that, that yeah. look. She's got a very mm. distinctive look, and I think it really epitomizes what what I feel, what I think a lot of people feel is a French look, French place to be, a French lifestyle. So it it feels mm. very mm. of the of its moment and of its genre, and um, it's it is a treat visually. Mm, absolutely, so it's a picture postcard version of a romantic Paris. Um, yes. Really, isn't it? Yeah, very understandable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I th- um, the film begins with a, a ten-minute prologue in which there we have this disembodied voice. It's uh, an omniscient narrator who gives us an overview of Amelie's childhood origins and the forces that shaped her amazing, quirky imagination. And in what I think is quite a bold overview. Um, it establishes the film's aesthetic. So we're presented with a series of vignettes detailing Amelie's, uh, her birth, uh, all the coincidences that sort of coincided at the same moment, one of which was Amelie's birth, uh, and the strange behaviour of her father, who um, is incapable of emotional intimacy with his daughter, yet who, uh, convinced she has an, abo- uh, um, an abnormal heart condition, he keeps her away from other children, uh, and also we, we, we see the bizarre accidental death of her mother at Notre Dame Cathedral. We also see uh, pictures of her, images of her uh, being homeschooled. And I think most importantly, we see her childhood secret world of enchantment. So the, I found the introduction particularly interesting. And you, you get a lot of these in French movies and they can be distracting. But I think this one serves a particular purpose. It's an introduction in which the narrator seems to have no connection with the story other than to tell us about the far-fetched circumstances surrounding Amelie's childhood, all of which displays the role of chance and what it has in our everyday lives. So for Amelie, it leads her to find refuge in her own imaginary world. And the, the narrator appears out of nowhere 
just to stress the feelings of the characters, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, uh, why they're feeling the way they do. And while this contradicts one of the basic rules of cinematic storytelling, show, don't tell, I think it can also be seen as a projection of Amelie's imagination and her way of thinking about the world. So in this way, this fil the film's very bold opening narrative functions as a, as a way of building up a very vivid portrait of Amelie's point of view. Um, what makes Amelie stand out as a very special character for me is her ability to see the world through imaginative, childlike eyes. And unlike other children who lose this ability when they grow up, Amelie has retained her childlike inventiveness and she prefers to live in her own imaginary world. So, for example, when she finds the hidden box in her apartment, she imagines the entire set of circumstances that led to the box being hidden beneath, uh, behind the walls. And she's determined to reunite it with her owner. For her, it's not enough just to be imaginative. For her, she needs to be able to take action and follow through on that impulse. There are some amazing characters in the film. Um, the film introduces uh, some really charming and quirky characters. There's Amelie's co-workers in the cafe, three women. We have Suzanne, a former bareback rider with a limp. There's Georgette, a hypochondriac tobacconist. And then there's Gina, a waitress healer who cracks bones. We also meet Madeline, the concierge who is still mourning the death of her husband, there's Lucien, a clumsy grocer's assistant, and his bully of a boss, Collignon. Amelie's father, of course, who's obsessed with his garden gnome. And then I think probably most significantly, we have Dufayel, one of her neighbours, a reclusive neighbour. He's an artist with brittle bone disease. And he becomes Amelie's guardian angel as the story progresses. Through a series of really wonderful subplots, we watch Amelie as she notices the, the minor everyday details around her, she feels sympathy for all those people in her environment and her neighborhood, and she challenges their mundane lives. So Amelie touches everyone around her as she engineers a series of different events, all designed to produce specific outcomes. For example, she plays matchmaker for Georgette, the tobacconist in the cafe, and Joseph, a jilted customer, she lifts the spirits of her apartment blocks concierge and then she stands up for Lucien, who is constantly being humiliated in public by his author or authoritarian boss. Um, I think one of the charms of the film lies in watching her imaginative strategies as she invents ways of bringing, to light, bringing, bringing happiness into everyone's lives. But while she does this, she is still very much alone. So when we see her in her apartment, her world is quieter and her loneliness is more apparent. Um, as she embarks on her quest to spread joy throughout her neighborhood, she's led on her own journey of discovery in which she finds true love. So through a series of coincidences, she sees Nino, in a railway station, he's a fellow dreamer. He's obsessed with collecting discarded ID photos at the photo booths all over the city. And as Amelie realizes her feelings for him, we're left wondering if she will be brave enough to act upon those feelings. Now, I think Amelie is quite an unconventional romantic comedy in some ways, uh, in which we see the protagonist encounter a series of quirky characters. It provides us with a glimpse into their lives while celebrating the charms of Paris. But this is not Paris in reality. As we follow Amelie around the city, we are presented with a heightened reality. The Montmartre and Amelie lives in, it's, it's an unreal dream-like version of Paris. It's a place of striking, contrasting colours and eccentric characters, but it doesn't actually define what Paris is really like. It's set in, its, in a world of its own. It's a poetic version of everyday Paris life. The, um, the film has a hyper-real, fantastic quality. It's filled with vivid reds and yellows, 
And these promote a feeling of romance and of everyday magic. It's a surreal, dreamy world. It's a bit like a fairy tale in some ways, in which Amelie's vivid imagination does everything from bringing clouds to life to having conversations with lamps and paintings and things. The, I think the film also contains elements of the travelling angel story because as Amelie moves through the cityscape in the guise of a good angel who's awakening the, the unacknowledged longings in her neighbours, but unlike movies like Babette's Feast and Chocolat, in which the protagonist enters a community in trouble, the problems of the characters within that community are detailed and the angel who is perfect fixes them the film Amelie begins with the traveling angel who is far from perfect. She has psychological problems. We're told that since childhood, she's become withdrawn and she's afraid to take emotional risks that she's, she is unable to love. And in the first half of the film, Amelie moves through the city. She spends time helping her neighbors. And then about the midpoint, the narrative changes direction up to this point in the narrative, the film has been chronicling the elaborate ways in which Amelie um, forestalls um, examining her own loneliness because she's secretly helping other people. She uses that as a decoy. Uh, and after this midpoint, she becomes one who is secretly helped by those around her, first by her co-worker Gina, uh, who intervenes between Amelie and Nino and brings them together. And then by Dufayel, who becomes her guardian angel and guides her through the final part of her own emotional journey within the narrative, finally enabling her to step out of her dream world and embrace love in her life. So um, I think Amelie celebrates, it's all about celebrating life's small pleasures. It's a poetic story that captures the magic and beauty of everyday life. It's a heartwarming film with charming and quirky characters and a very colourful and vibrant visual style. But it draws you into the story world. And I think the film reminds us of the need to step outside the confines of our own narrow comfort zones and to take emotional risks in our own lives. Hmm. Very interesting perspectives. And I think I've got a few that we can challenge each other on over on our podcast. So if you want to keep following our discussion here, join us over on the podcast, just search for Script Department wherever you get your podcasts, or you can use the links that are found in the video um, description below, or even better, subscribe and you will never miss another episode ever again. For now, we will say salut. Mm-hmm.